Give me a take these. I'm sorry, the old ones. Uh, I think we're good. We're good. So I'll take these. So, 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 yeah, so we're going to pass up the new ones, right? You can. <laughs> It didn't seem to make the front row at all. Oh. Yeah. I can pick them both up after. Okay. <laughs> we're good. Uh, we were flying very low when we got in here at 4 o'clock, coming out of a meeting that went till 12.52. <laughs> so we were exciting. We did, the, we did the chair slides at the end of the first session. Okay. Are we supposed to start now, or do you need to take me? Have fun. So, uh, three yes. point, three point. Yes. so we will be starting in just a moment or two. So let's go ahead and get started. Not right now. <laughs> maybe, yeah, uh, maybe in about an hour. <laughs> um, so um, I'm still Spencer. And me here. And we're getting ready to start the second TSV area session. Um, we are passing around a new set of blue sheets. So if you were at the last meeting, uh, please sign the blue sheets again, because that's per meeting. Um, are we putting up the note well again? Yes. Excellent. So we will put up the note well again so that everybody can note well that things said uh, here are ITF contributions. Yeah, there is. Uh, yeah, we had one session already, and we start in the into the next sessions. Uh, we have um, a presentation by Tom Herbert, and then uh, we have the rest of the time, which we probably hopefully might not use completely, on um, a discussion about congestion control and how to handle congestion control um, algorithms and congestion control work in the IETF. Um, but we start with Tom. Where is he? There. Perfect. Hi, um, my name is Tom Herbert, and I'm going to talk about Express Data Path, or XDP. 
A little bit of background. This is a project that we started in the Linux networking stack about a little over a year ago. And if you remember at uh, IETF in Seoul in the open plenary, we had that discussion about the denial of service attacks in Dyn, um, and there was actually a Cloudflare presentation. One of the rationales behind XDP was precisely uh, for addressing denial of service attacks, kind of like that. And um, it turns out that uh, Cloudflare actually um, presented a discussion about a year ago on what they were doing to solve denial of service in their system. And basically, they were going through a pretty long path and getting really miserable numbers. So some of us in the Linux community, we started looking at the problem and realized uh, we need a better way. So that's kind of the background. I'll get a little more into uh, some of the things we're doing with Cloudflare in a minute. Um, next slide. So uh, agenda today, so I'll go a little bit with history, uh, specifically user space stacks, which have kind of been the um, current model to solve a lot of these problems. And then we'll go through the, the foundation, BPF, EB, eBPF, and then present the solution and then uh, how we're looking forward uh, to extend the solution. So user land frameworks, um, the idea behind these is that there's a library in user space and the application can access the networking directly. So in this case, packets, for instance, arrive on a queue and a, a user space application or process processes them directly without any interference or any processing in the kernel. So this is kind of like a direct data path from the network to the application, uh, completely bypasses the kernel, it's safe to use, uh, people like that, um, and it has found a lot of niches, particularly in high-frequency trading um, and some HPC realms. So the question is, wh why, why did we ever bother with this? We've had kernel networking stacks for years, uh, BSD stacks, BSD sockets, they've all been kind of developed. The nominal reason is usually given is performance. So by having uh, direct access to, say, a ne network device from user space, we can squeeze out some performance. But some of the other reasons um, are safety. For instance, because of the isolation that the system gives you, if we crash an application in user space, it doesn't crash the whole system. So that's kind of a nice feature. Uh, developing, uh, developing in the kernel is uh, difficult. In some sense, a lot of people are a little uh, trepid to do this. And one thing we found is there's a lot of user space programmers. Um, you look at companies like Google and Facebook, they have maybe 20 or 30 kernel engineers and thousands and thousands of C++ programmers and Java programmers. So there's a little bit of, of weight towards kind of, we know how to do stuff in user space. We get more and more into user space. That's somewhat of a trend we've been seeing. And another big one, and this is one that, that we've known for a while, has a lot to do with upgrades, reboots, things like that. If we have to reboot the kernel because of a problem or reboot the system, very invasive, takes a long time to upgrade kernels, uh, what have you. So that's kind of a, a, a known ongoing problem. So on the other hand, um, user space stacks uh, frameworks, they're difficult to use for general solutions. If you look, most of them are usually some niche applications. Uh, best example is probably the high frequency traders, the guys who want to execute trades in microseconds. They really don't need anything except access to the stack, maybe do UDP or TCP. Uh, but it's very dedicated application, so it's a good use case for this. For the general case, though, implementing, say, a full TCP IP stack in user space, very difficult to make work across all circumstances. Hybrid path solutions, uh, this is kind of what Cloudflare was doing originally. They were actually taking packets received in the kernel forwarding them into user space on a raw interface, doing the denial of service mitigation there, basically filtering out which packets to save, which packets uh, to forward. And then they were sending the packets back into the kernel, uh, do more processing there for TCP, and then actually go up to the application. So this kind of boomerang effect we've seen occasionally, uh, amazingly they claim this was better than, than implementing something in the kernel um, using TC classifiers. Uh, nevertheless, that's what they were doing. Uh, performance numbers, if you look at the documentation, um, a lot of the uh, 
documents about user space stacks will say they're 10, 10x, 100x faster than the kernel. Um, those are a little jaded. Uh, be careful about that. Uh, user space stacks will be faster, but not by so many orders of magnitude. But more practically, what we saw, um, for instance, at Facebook and Google when we considered doing this, if we have to bring in a separate stack, even in user space, maintaining two stacks in the same system, that's a little bit of a pain. So that's one of the um, kind of big uh, downsides to having user space stacks, and we still need a kernel stack. The other thing is user space uh, kind of implies more proprietary solutions. Uh, this can be good in some context for, for an application that needs that. But if you think in terms of a larger community, if we do have a good solution for denial of service, if one application needs it, it's probably true that almost all of them need it. So it's good to have that kind of community behind us. Uh, the other thing is there are some extra constraints. Uh, for instance, huge pages in DPDK. Um, these both help and, and kind of hurt. That, so they help and get the best performance, but they can actually hurt in some uh, generalization of the problem. So what we really need um, is going to be programmability of policy in, in the kernel. And it's actually programmability everywhere in networking, if you think about it. So the trend of SDN, for instance, is programmable networking, programmable in devices, programmable in the kernel, programmable from user space. So everything's programmable in some senses is, is kind of the goal. Uh, in the kernel, it's a particular issue. Like I mentioned, uh, kernels are typically monolithic, hard to update, making it nimble for programmability, kind of an oxymoron in some sense with uh, some of the goals of the kernel. Uh, next slide. So this is the long, um, long text of what we need, but the short answer is we just want something that's super programmable, super flexible, um, and part of the community so that we can share our solutions. And this was kind of the basis for how we started thinking about um, XDP Express Data Path. So now we can re um, go back in history a little bit. And the beginnings of our solution actually go back to 1992 at Lawrence Berkeley Labs. Uh, Van Jacobson and Stephen McCain kind of were the first to see that we need this programmability inside the kernel, at least for one small part. So from this, um, Berkeley Packet Filters was born. Uh, we've known about this for a long time. It's been heavily used in uh, TCP dump, packet filtering, um, trace dumps, things like that. Now, from the beginning, it was kind of limited. It was never really intended, at least back then, to be kind of an open, flexible platform for programmability. So it was kind of limited in what it could do. It had a whole two registers. Uh, was, I think, a 16-bit uh, system. So the idea was great. Uh, have a programmability of networking in the kernel, a, a packet parser that is effectively open-ended. But with the limitations, and I guess with we needed to develop the rest of the kernel, the rest of networking. So for about 24 years, we didn't see this hidden gem in some, in some sense. Next slide. So fast forward to 2015. And this thing called extended BPF was born. Alexei Stavrotov, um, now at Facebook, actually uh, had this idea, what if we extend BPF, uh, add a number of registers, make it full 64-bit system, make it compile easily from C code directly into uh, whatever assembly, whatever bytecode we need, um, have a, com a comprehensive instruction set, so we needed to add more than just simple Header parsing, we want 64-bit um, operation or 64-bit ops, atomic operations, uh, data structures, actual real data structures that we can put as ancillary data, use those for things like state, uh, what have you. Uh, the other important thing was, since we're running this code kind of loaded into the kernel, we need a model of safety. So we have this thing uh, called a, a verifier, which prevents code from doing bad things. So for instance, we can prevent division by zero or illegal memory accesses, uh, things like that, even though within, it's within the kernel. So the idea is that this gives us the same sort of isolation, same sort of um, guarantees that user space gives. However, we're still running natively in the kernel in some sense, 
with a very thin API. So effectively, we expect that to be uh, almost bare metal inside the kernel. So eBPF ended up being pretty successful. And right now in, in the Linux stack, this is used pretty much all over the place. The tracing guys really jumped onto this. So we used to have things like dtrace, strace. Uh, these were kind of difficult. We wanted them to be flexible, but we also needed some sort of programmability, like if I wanted to trace specific events, how do I program that? So they jumped on top of this, and now there's a whole um, kind of sub sub project on making BPF and trace dumps and logging work inside the kernel. Uh, it's even outside of networking. And one of the side effects of that was it became so big that we now have hardware uh, support for it and kind of heading down uh, that path. Next slide. So the BPF architecture is pretty elaborate now. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of use cases uh, at the top, even outside of networking. So we're using these for analytics, uh, the logging, as I mentioned. And the good news is we can write this in different languages. So the, the original BPF was pretty much machine code, assembly, hard to use. Uh, about, about the same time EP, eBPF came out, LLVM added compiler support, so now we can write BPF directly in C, so that's a huge uh, win for programmability. Um, this goes through various kernel subsystems. Uh, we have a JIT compiler and also backend compilers uh, into specific platforms. And then, as I mentioned, BPF is running across various forms of hardware. So all of this is great. Uh, it still doesn't really answer the question of how do we do denial of service mitigation at line rate, millions of packets per second. That's where Express Data Path came from, or at least the motivation. So about 2016, we started looking at the denial of service problems in particular, uh, also load balancing, load balancers, things like that, and we came up with this concept of XDP. The idea is to run a BPF program as low as possible in the kernel, basically on the device. So the program is actually sitting, the receive part of the program sits on receive queues. As packets come in, we actually process the raw packet. So there's no concept of metadata, no concept of going through various layers of protocol processing. We're just basically calling a function, a BPF program, saying here's the packet, here's the beginning of it, here's the end of it, maybe a little bit of, of ancillary information that we got from the device, but that's it. Uh, BPF program, go, do whatever you need to do. So the BPF program takes this, and it actually comes up with a simple decision. Either drop the packet, uh, accept the packet into the rest of the stack, or um, transmit the packet. Uh, transmit the packet usually entails either in uh, popping or pushing encapsulation headers, and then sending it back out right now at the same interface, but eventually any interface. All of this being done basically on the raw packet uh, for various reasons. We don't need to do DMA on maps, for instance, or any fancy memory allocation. So very fast, we get the speed. Uh, BPF gives us the programmability, and the environment gives us kind of that safe context that I was talking about before. So the important thing is this XDP data path, even though it's in the kernel, um, works in harmony with the kernel. It's still kind of uh, programmable. Looks like. So from this, we kind of derived the XDP packet processor and pretty much what I just said. So at the bottom, we have the various input queues from a device. They call into the BPF uh, program, and the BPF program just returns drop, in which case we just discard the packet. Uh, not a lot of work to do there. Uh, forward is rewriting the packet, maybe an address, and then sending it back out the same interface. And then we can go through the receive stack, uh, GRO is uh, one thing that we have to, still have to do. That's a way to coalesce packets of a, a single TCP connection into a larger packet for the advantages of processing uh, larger packets in the stack. And then those packets can go up, and then if we receive the packet, it just becomes a normal um, packet in the kernel. We just do the normal processing. So, for instance, if we were doing denial of service mitigation, we could do the the mitigation at the lower layer, and if the packet's ac acceptable, we just send it right into the stack. If it's not acceptable, it gets dropped. 
Let's see. So XPP has a few important properties. So one is it is designed for high performance. Um, so there's a number of techniques that we know about. Um, user space stacks have been using these, and we can put these same sort of techniques inside the kernel on XDP, spin polling, uh, optimizing uh, cache misses with cache prefetch, um, four or five other things. All of this is lockless, so we never uh, get into atomic operations in this path. As I mentioned, it's dev de designed for programmability. So we can add new functionality into the kernel without changing the kernel, without a reboot. Uh, everything can now be done on the fly. Uh, it is not kernel bypass uh, in the sense that it's integrated into the kernel and we can call into kernel functions and use kernel data structures. This will become really important, for instance, if we want to do uh, stateful TCP and we actually want to see does the current local stack actually have a TCP state. So we can access that TCP state from the BPF program to determine uh, if there's a state associated with it. Uh, it does not replace the TCP IP stack. This right now is a, a layer below it. Uh, we do have some ideas for kind of introducing some of these features at a higher layer, layer to get some of the benefits. Uh, but for now, it's uh, programs running at the lower layer. There are some other BPF programs that run in concert with sockets and some of the other aspects of TCP. So this is kind of one aspect, one application of BPF in the networking stack. Uh, but the point here is this is so low level. This is, in a sense, below the stack, uh, kind of a pre-processor for the stack. And then the last one is, is very important. So XDP does not require any specialized hardware. We, in theory, can run XDP on pretty much any device. Um, we've added it to, I think, five or six devices now. It's really helpful if the device has multi-queue, uh, but that's the only extent, we, only property we need. So we don't need uh, virtual functions or, or any of that stuff. Now, advanced features, we do want to interoperate with and use those. However, fundamentally, this is um, something we believe can, uh, so we can solve problems in the field with existing hardware with software change, so it's kind of an important feature. Next slide. So currently, XDP is uh, being deployed for various use cases. Best way to describe it is layer two, layer three packet processing. Uh, denial of service mitigation, the easiest one is just have a sort of blacklist of bad IPs and we can filter on those. Uh, very simple uh, sort of lookups. More sophisticated, Denial of service protection gets us into some stateful uh, TCP, for instance. Pattern matching, can we identify signatures, uh, bad packets. Uh, at some point, we may even need um, more advanced uh, lookup mechanisms, um, regular expressions, what have you. Some of the other applications, uh, Facebook right now is deploying this for load balancing. Uh, this is replacing IPV, IPV, IPVS. Uh, as a solution, we're finding has a lot more performance, and that's uh, working out really well. We're also seeing use cases in switching, routing, tunnel termination. Uh, again, at Facebook, uh, I was working on ILA routing, and one of our use cases was basically build an ILA router in the network. It's nothing more than a glorified uh, host route switch, in a sense. So a packet comes in, we rewrite 64 bits of the destination address and send the packet on. It's a very simple process. It was like 20 lines of BPF code, and we're able to build a device uh, kind of doing line rate without requiring specialized ASIC, specialized hardware, so that's a win. A few performance numbers. So this was um, Intel Xeon with Mellanox, um, MLX5 NIC. Um, it's a kind of continuous thing. We've been uh, getting performance numbers to improve and improve, so these are kind of the latest ones. So for comparison, the kernel using TC uh, traffic control, which is kind of the typical way that we would implement this sort of functionality, uh, about 3.5 million packets per second on one core. XDP uh, doing the same thing gets us up to about 16.9 million. And XDP transmit, a little more work because we have to rewrite the packet, we're still at 13.7 million packets per second. Overall in the system, if we allow 24 cores we're getting 45 million packets per second transmit. I believe that's uh, the current hardware limitation. 
So it's scaling pretty well. Uh, one of the benefits of, of doing it this way, since we don't have a lot of atomic operations, most of these will scale linearly with a number of cores. Uh, the reason we test one core is we need to show uh, performance at that level uh, for certain attacks that are obviously, like a tuple attack would be on one core. So that's why uh, we typically measure this in number of cores and then as a whole system. Next slide. So looking forward, uh, right now we're planning on enabling more drivers. Currently we have five supported. Um, we'll be adding more. The virtualization was actually su just recently supported. There is hardware support for XDP. Uh, Netronome is the first case of that. So basically the idea is uh, offload the BPF program. So BPF is nothing more than some sort of bytecode when you compile it. In theory, it can run on anything, hardware, software, what have you. So they can download the BPF program, and we can run that in uh, hardware. Uh, let's see. So uh, we need to build out the ecosystem of contributed solutions. So the good news, uh, going back to Cloudflare, uh, next week we're having a, another conference on Linux networking. They are presenting a solution for denial of service mitigation for XDP. Looking forward to that one. Um, another important one that we learned from something like VPP and some other initiatives, packet batching in terms of processing is important. So the more packets we can process at once through a particular piece of code, the better instruction cache efficiency, what have you, uh, we see better performance with that. So these are ways to squeeze more performance out of the system. We do have a little bit of a performance gap that we're still working on with DPDK. As I said, it's not orders of magnitude. It's within a few percentage points, and we have some ideas on that. One of the big differences between user space and kernel is user space can enable certain um, instruction sets on the x86, for instance, so floating point instructions and string instructions can be used. We haven't really uh, uh, turned those on in the kernel for obvious reasons that are kind of difficult. Uh, if necessary, we might we might get into that. Also, we kind of anticipating some TLB um, translation look aside buffers issues with huge pages in certain applications. So that's another thing we're looking at. Uh, and as I mentioned, busy polling and some other techniques are certainly um, techniques we can also integrate into XDP to, to get that last bit of performance. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. I think that's some interesting stuff that's going on in the Linux kernel and hopefully helps us to do a little bit more experimentation with new schemes here. So, yeah, next one is Michael. He's coming up and he's bringing his computer. Perfect. Um, so we now have the rest of our time we can use freely for discussion on congestion control. Um, in the IETF because we see a lot of congestion control uh, work coming up and we want to get feedback from the community. Uh, what should we do here? Is this something we should target in the IETF, in the IRTF, um, and where and how and so on? And so uh, we have two people giving a little bit of background. One is uh, Michael, who's also talking here as the chair of ICCRG. And then afterwards we have Praveen. Uh, giving some more background, and then we have time for discussion. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm bringing my own laptop and plugging this in because there's an animation I want to show you. I have uh, I work at the university. I teach. I do so many presentations, but the best ever animation in my whole life is the one you're about to see. <laughs> <laughs> it's truly fantastic. You're, you're gonna. You're <laughs> It's because it's amazing. You, you know, if if time permits, <laughs> if time permits, I'm <laughs> I might actually show it twice. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so the history of ICCRG, ICCRG was created. So this this is about the role of congestion control and the ICCRG and how this whole stuff fits together in the ITF. It's really, you know, why was ICCRG created? Why does it exist? It was created. Uh, at some point, because there were all these proposals on new congestion controls, cubic, uh, HTCP, compound TCP at that time. They were brought to TCPM, and TCPM was busy, and they needed a place where these people could go and discuss 
and maybe give up, hopefully give up, right? Or maybe continue and then, then at some point come back and then they've been pre-evaluated and uh, I'm here to tell you that this is a good procedure and it's been actually working. Um, so yeah, the phrase was we need propose, propose, uh, a place where we can push proposals over the fence and then they can bake there until they're ready and then uh, this is how we do it. So that's actually, <laughs> we're, we're the happy trash can of the ITF. We got stuff, <laughs> you know, it bakes there. And now, yeah, it's coming. Okay. <laughs> Here's a very important aspect to this animation. Before anything else happens, there's nothing else there, right? But TCPM is already grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> because that's <laughs> that's how they operate. So uh, this was IETF 75 2009. They're still grumpy. They always are, right? But this is about about the historic procedure. We have a proposal coming in in rainbow colors. <laughs> it's IW10, and it was proposed to TCPM at this IETF, and off it went. <laughs> and then <laughs> it was. <laughs> that's, that's what happens, you know. I mean, you spend time. <laughs> you know, this is your G, and it came back anyway. And um, then they were happy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty much how we operate. You know, you bring stuff to us. We, you know, spend some time in trash, <laughs> and up afterwards, it's beautiful and shiny and everything. And. Uh, so in this case, it took only three, I mean, that's maybe a positive aspect here. It only took three ITFs right, to come back and then took some more time in TCPM and then it was an experimental RFC. Uh, ICCRG also can publish documents. That's you know, something that people don't seem to be aware of. That's the IRTF track. Other groups are publishing a lot. Uh, they can be informational, experimental. We have only two, congestion control and the RFC series and open research issues in congestion control. It's kind of survey stuff. Why don't we have any specs of any experimental things? Only because people don't seem to care about it or don't want that. Uh, it really is an open question. I believe that people kind of, I know, I've been proposing it actively to people. They were like, oh, oh, I see a G publication. I'd rather go in the corner and shoot myself. I, I don't know why that is, right? <laughs> but it seems to be they really don't want to do that. So. Uh, one of the questions, you know, that was that was asked, uh, that I'm trying to address here, is: Is it necessary that I that congestion control work is spread around the IETF the way it is? I personally think this is an, an inevitable thing because congestion control as a function is intrinsically tied to the goals that that the, the protocol is trying to solve. If you think of MPTCP, uh, you know, MPTCP's congestion control is really really clear on what kinds of goals it has and what it's trying to achieve which is very different from, say, LATBAT or from, say, the TCP. Well, not so different from TCP, okay, but from our MCAT, for instance, which has, has a goal of uh, being delay-based yet interoperating with other flows and so on and so forth. Um, so I'll conclude by saying your happy trash can is always here to serve you. Any questions? Jana Yengar, who's... Uh, also holding <laughs> the trash can, um, <laughs> but and shaking. There's a uh, there's we this is uh, just to continue this thread. We have right now um, Cubic that's sitting in TCPM, and we have a BBR that's been presented at ICCRG a couple of times. And if we end up, you know, getting a draft out of that at some point, there is going to be a question of where should it land. And bear in mind that we now have a quick working group that actually has condition control also as a part of it. So going forward, that is a real question of where should all of these condition control activity lie? Should we even in, in retrospect now, you know, maybe take cubic and say, well, you should, you know, write it in such a way that it also applies to to um, um, TCP. Maybe we should have a cubic TCP and a cubic um, a quick draft. I don't know. But if you're d describing this without framing, it certainly seems to belong in a place that's not specific to a protocol. Leadbat was a perfect example of this. Uh, but going forward, I think we should think about how to write condition control documents so that they're separable from the protocol itself, and maybe also having ways to express how they are uh, specifically uh, exemplified in those protocols. Okay, yeah. 
So the IETF a long time ago bought this dogma, TCP friendly, which is of course an oxymoron because it's not about TCP at all, it's about Reno. Um, we've reached, the internet has reached the scale where you should replace those words by not relevant in today's internet. And the problem is that really belongs in this working group, this, this research group, is if you disband the words TCP friendly, what do you replace them with? How do you say freedom from congestion collapse? How do you say reasonable behavior under resource exhaustion? How do, there's a whole bunch of things that TCP friendly embodies that TCP friendly ha, has no longer, no longer functions to provide. Um, and we really need to replace the TCP friendly dogma guess, by some other safety consideration. I guess the m probably most accepted definition that we have is in one of these RFCs that I think I think that the one about usefulness of best effort traffic from Sally that says it's about avoiding starvation of other flows. So I right. think that is at least you know <laughs> as a so, lower end. <laughs> so freedom of from congestion collapse and avoiding certain pathological behaviors, which include starvation, although that might not yeah. be the only one. It's a bit extreme. Seem right? to be seem to be a better bar to be striving for. But the problem is if you, for instance, look at, at the research community, academic research, review panels still dismiss protocols that don't address the friendliness issue. And making authors spend 20% of their page space explaining why TCP friendly, why the protocol is adequately TCP friendly, is actually doing us all a disservice because it means there's some very good ideas out there that probably are fieldable in today's internet, which are in fact being banned from being published because they're not TCP friendly. So I, I wonder, you know, if this discussion is already going into congestion control issues, I mean, maybe it's better to wait for Praveen and put that at the end of that because this is, yeah, because this is about, I mean, that was just a procedural introduction, but he has a few slides raising some general questions about congestion control, maybe it would be even better yeah. you know, for so him to moderate the discussion and get this started in that way. Praveen only has like three more slides, which fit very well in the discussion that we just started. So let's look at them and then have the discussion. You can stay there, it will not take very long. Yeah, so we want that discussion, but I think it should be him. Thank you. You can also just um, stay in front if there are more questions. And then my screen is just gone completely. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Praveen. Um, Michael touched on the uh, operational aspects of congestion control in the IETF. Um, I wanted to also bring up the some of the issues that we have been facing as an implementer of, of TCP congestion control and various various other forms of congestion control. Um, so yeah, I don't have any fancy animations, but uh, you can go to the next one. Uh, so this is kind of a recap of where we are in terms of uh, condition control support and various operating systems. Uh, if any of this is out of date, please uh, let me know and I'll fix up the slides later. Uh, Android and Chrome OS are doing Cubic by default. Um, I believe iOS and Mac OS are also doing Cubic by default. Uh, Windows has been doing Compound TCP for a while. Um, and on the other front, there is uh, a lot of been uh, a lot of progress in uh, data center congestion control, where you're dealing with low low RTTs uh, as well as uh, different forms of workloads like MapReduce, uh, data center TCP, uh, DCQCN is for RDMA, same idea applied to RDMA, um, and some other variants of DC TCP which use accurate TCN feedback. Um, then there is obviously BBR, um, which has now I believe based on today morning stock being expanded also to uh, run over van uh, and then timely which is uh, delay based uh, condition control uh, and there have been like uh, academia proposals in ICCRG as well uh, PCC uh, Sprout Remy um, the other kind of interesting thing to notice is that the network operators are trying to solve the problem in the network using uh, active queue management uh, but the end devices have no visibility about this. So they cannot, for example, assume that a given network has AQM or not. There is no way to detect that. Uh, so the operating system uh, implementation has to kind of uh, account for the case where there is no AQM. Um, 
quick is coming up. There might be cases now where um, popular mobile applications write their own transport. So things are getting to a stage where uh, there's not just one or two congestion control algorithms. That, there could be 10 congestion control algorithms sharing a bottleneck link. And it becomes very difficult to kind of reason about uh, performance um, or you know um, how the network would behave. Uh, the other interesting case is IaaS uh, in the public cloud, where again you have VMs uh, that are running different operating systems, so kind of doing different forms of congestion control on the same bottleneck links. Uh, so buffer bloat is real. Uh, this is like uh, smooth RTD information from like TCP connections on desktop and Xbox consoles. So if you notice, obviously. Uh, I don't want to imply that um, correlations means causation here, but it does look like uh, on, in peak load times, uh, the RTT is inflating a lot. And this impacts everything from like page load times to responsiveness in games. So this is a real problem. We are seeing this data right now. So, uh, so these are kind of some of the kind of uh, questions that I wanted this room to kind of chime in on uh, and debate. Um, so, yes, a multitude of congestion control algorithms. So, how do implementers deal with this situation? Do we test the entire kind of uh, matrix here of uh, every congestion control working with another congestion control as well as AQM? Uh, this matrix is kind of blowing up. So, as an implementer, my question is, what would be what would be the best way to kind of address that? that problem. Um, the other question I have is, how do we prevent uh, this from becoming an arms race? Uh, for example, when we run tests with cubic and compound sharing the same bottleneck link, uh, cubic just kills compound. And then it would create a perception problem because people are running speed tests that, you know, for example, Windows is you know slower than Android, for example, right? So the question is, how do we kind of prevent this from everybody trying to go as fast as they can and kind of causing buffer bloat to become worse over time. Um, I think uh, Matt was talking about TCP friendly. So uh, yeah, uh, I have the que this question now. What does TCP friendly actually mean? Uh, BBR is also complicating things a lot more because it's heuristic based. So now, um, you know, in presence of BBR, how do we define things like RTT friendliness, uh, latecomer uh, fairness? And yeah, the final question is, uh, what do we do about this? Is is just publishing a set of information RFCs good enough? Because as an implementer, I feel um, it's not good enough because it seems like there is not enough clear guidance on um, uh, how do we kind of deal with this situation today in today's networks. So yeah, um, I would request people to like. Um, Could you expand a little bit more on your last point? Uh, your as an implementer, you feel that uh, informational RFCs aren't giving enough guidance. What would be more useful, or what would what you feel is lacking? Uh, my question would be, um, how do we kind of define what it means to coexist with other congestion control algorithms? And again, the TCP friendliness question remains. So. Um, do, does every RFC have to go out there and take into account every popular condition control algorithm and list how it is friendly with it? How do we define RTT fairness and latecomer fairness and all of that? Uh, so, okay, so my other comment is really uh, addressed a little bit more towards uh, Michael's presentation, but I think it's it's relevant to both. Um, <laughs> but just going back to the, the happy trash can, which I believe is a uh, a metaphor that should live on for a long time. I hope Lars gets a chance to, we should give him a happy trash can as a, as a goodbye <laughs> gift. <clears throat> um, the, uh, so the ICCRG, when it was created, if memory serves, um, one of the, the, um, the asks from the IETF to the IRTF in creating this research group was to come up with some way of evaluating whether congestion control was safe, how to fairly compare Different, uh, uh, different algorithms, uh, because um, we were there were working group meetings where people would show uh, plots that showed their favorite algorithm was uh, performing really well, and then somebody else would you know, and 
they were mutually exclusive. And so uh, the ITF community, unable to, uh, to sort through that, said, well, you guys go figure it out. Um, and they sent them off to the happy trash can. Um, so I think that that's still a really valuable role. And I think what the discussion, and I'm really sort of thinking about the, the, the comment that Matt made. Oh, good, you're here. Um, no, Lars is in line. Um, uh, uh, I, I think that Matt made a really good comment, which is that our criteria for how we evaluate transport protocols has so, probably changed um, over the past couple of decades. And um, we haven't done a really good job of articulating that. I mean, some of that falls on the research community, but I think that from a, from a, uh, this is a community of uh, implementers and operators and engineers, and so I think that we can, we can speak to the research community and say how, uh, how we prioritize or how we think things should be uh, uh, evaluated for, uh, for safety or desirability. Uh, and I think that that, uh, I still think that that would fall into the ICCRG's bucket as opposed yeah. to the ITF's bucket, because I think that that's still kind of a research consensus sort of question. Uh, there's also this TCP evaluation suite that has been around for a very, very long time and it has suffered from uh, cycle problems and has been handed over and at some point uh, when David Hayes was in charge of it and while he was working for me, I pushed for getting this done and getting it uh, into RFC status and we presented it here and it was pushed back for being outdated, which it is. <laughs> Uh, so all we need is a volunteer, you know, to take that and update it to the current state, and that will never happen. <laughs> but I, I, I would be very happy if, you know, I mean, I'm, I am soliciting volunteers. <laughs> David Black, one of the chairs of uh, TCWG Transport Area Working Group, which we'll meet right after this. Uh, I like the happy trash can icon. I'm going to go, go look at the website, see, see, see if I can find one that represents a whole variety of stuff that comes our way. Um, we deal with congestion concerns, some of which are control, some of which maybe the control word isn't applicable to, for a whole pile of things that haven't yet been mentioned here. Uh, SCTP lives in TSUWG. Anybody who wants to play with DCCP comes to us. Uh, there's congestion control in the, U in, in the uh, new UD U UDP usage guidelines. UDP and CAP is a whole other adventure in and of itself. So, Michael, I tend to agree with your comment earlier that uh, we're going to spread congestion control all over the place. And at least speaking from my parochial perspective, wearing a TSUWG working group chair hat, having ICCRG be a central clearinghouse for congestion control issues that we don't understand because we haven't got, got the expertise in the small set of people who wants to work on who might, might want to work on something is incredibly useful. I would encourage you to continue. Can, can I add something? Thanks. Um, Thanks for that. I, I don't think the question is do we still need ICCRG. I think there is no question about it. It's, it's a, they do good work. Uh, that's where the research has come and we get the input from research that we really need. Um, my question is rather um, can we give SCI ETF any recommendation on what to do? Because our current recommendation is use Reno, which is a little bit outdated. Um, our soon future recommendation will be use Cubic because there's a draft out there which soon will be an RFC. Uh, and the reason why we think it can be an IETF RFC is because it's deployed largely enough that we know it's safe. Um, but it's still not like where we are at the state of the art. So how can we make our recommendation we give in the IETF a little bit more up to date? That's my question. Lars Eiger, so, so um, Michael said a bunch of the, I was going to say, so this slide could have been from 10 years ago yeah. um, <laughs> be, because it's, yeah, yeah. it's the exact same questions we asked ourselves when we had Hamilton, TCP and Cubic and, and Compound, right? Um, and back then we had Sally still around and active and she basically said we're going to do this evaluation suite and there's a paper on it and, and then somebody turned into into NS2 code and um, that suite is, is very boring, right? It's basically just a bunch of scenarios and the, the idea was that um, for the ITF but also for the academic research community, if your paper didn't run through at least these scenarios and showed us the plots, right? And they were really, really prescriptive that, you know, this is the parameter, this is the metric, here's the range plot this uh, for your thing and compare it against the others, you know, we, you would be automatically rejected um, or you wouldn't get FaceTime at the ITF. So the idea was really to, to provide this sort of, um, you know, how would you call this today? I don't know, test cases or something. Yeah, yeah, um, it's, it's very boring work, right? So, so <laughs> thanks for kicking David to do this, but 
So that, that would be one way forward. And, and um, today, right, there's better tooling. Uh, we probably wouldn't do this with NS2 anymore, I hope. Um, so that, that's one way forward um, if, if we believe. But then you need to keep adding to it, right? And, and it's, it's, at yeah, best, yeah, it's yeah. something. I mean, I, I think it's like looking at the years, I would say it's a non feasible way forward. And that's because I, we, didn't, we never got you know, enough volunteer cycles. Yeah. The, the other problem with it really is that um, it, as networks get faster, right? And there's some data center stuff earlier, right? Um, forget it, right? The, the, the hardware effects are, are so overriding that you, you can take your NS2 simulation and, and you know, throw it away. And, and for the data center case, we really don't have any way to do large scale anything other than running in a data center. Um, and, and it's getting even harder to compare. Um, the, the one thing I'm sort of, since I'm, since I'm uh, rambling here, the one thing I think that is going to be interesting for ICCRG that isn't uh, all sort of gloom and doom is that it's quick, right? Be because it has um, a whole new set of information about the path that is better, quote unquote, than what you get with TCP. And so there's a lot of new meat for congestion control researchers to play around with and come up with new schemes that are actually, you know, improving things compared to what you can do with TCP. So I think that that's my hope for for where where a lot of research will happen in the future. Um, so that that's some and that's something that won't happen in the quick working group. I hope no, it, it won't happen in the quick working group. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> Christian Wittema, I'd like to make a comment on the province uh, slide. There is that. When you design new congestion control algorithm, you, you want to basically provide the best use of the network. So you, you want to do something like uh, was in BBRs, basically aim for being very conservative on how you use the resource and generally be nice. And the problem with that, and it was mentioned in the BBR talk this morning, is that there are times where you are competing with algorithms that are not nice at all. And they behave like pigs and will just consume all the resources if you give them an opportunity. And the point with that is that means that the nice guys cannot get in the network because it will be known that they will be facing pigs and when they face the pigs, they lose. And that means that you end up having to design your software as having two modes. It will have the nice mode and if your detection code tells you that you have a pig on the network, you will have the pig mode. Also called a cubic or whatever you call it, right? Okay. And, and the, the problem with that is that it's very easy to design something like that. What is not easy is how you get out of the pig mode when the pig is gone. And, and we, we don't see that as part of the actual test cases that we have today because we don't recognize that people have put pigs on the network. Yeah. Yeah. No, they, they will. But look, it's... No. Yeah. yeah. But, but they're not always there. So you, you'd like... Yeah. Yeah. No, this, we know it's probably okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's my my point is that we, we should really have recognize this idea that the state of the network is binary. If we want evolution, we will have to recognize that we have the nice mode and the pig mode. And the pig mode is when you're competing with cubic and you need to be as pig as they are. That's uh Yes, I mean uh, this is a real problem today when like for example um lead bat or compound are on the same link with cubic. Um this is a real problem. Um uh, because uh being nice on the network just doesn't work. Yeah, why be nice to TCP? Why be friendly to TCP when it won't return the favor? I was quoting Andrew McGregor from Remcat. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's one of the things that caused me to stop worrying about this stuff is realizing that in the, sort of a, a large fraction of the big commercial cases where the money is in the internet today, the the issue is boils down to all these things about fairness and AQM and and diff serve and all this stuff. It boils down to which of your customers do you want not to be able to run HDTV during prime time? 
And if you build enough capacity where all of the customers can get HDTV during prime time, nothing else matters. And th it is this effect that is driven at such that the internet doesn't care much about congestion control. You have bottlenecks at the edges that are at a few megabits per second, which are, or, or even tens of megabits, even, even a gigabit per second, which is not, which is a small fraction of the core. No individual flow can ever cause congestion in the core. All of the symptoms of, of, of overload are, are local. What you care about is that you have sane behavior under local overload. And all of the rest of the stuff just doesn't matter anymore. It, it stopped being important at, at today's internet scale. What is important is the fact that the research community and a large number of other people are still solving irrelevant problems. Problems that, that, that the solutions to mean that their solutions, the solutions to the problem that they have posed is irrelevant to today's internet. And we need to fix that. One of the things that we don't have is a good way of defining whether or not a protocol is safe. I, I recently read in a paper a comment that said, oh, well, we're using TCP, so, so we know that we have, don't have to worry about congestion collapse. No, it's trivial to write applications that will cause congestion collapse. Unfortunately, you can cause congestion collapse with DNS. So it is a complicated problem. It is a very complicated problem of defining what is a safe protocol. And it is really the problem that we care about. Mir Kulevin, I wanted to add on on the um, test suite stuff. So um, I think the reason, another reason why I didn't um, proceed further is because it's actually not that easy. I mean, it might be boring, but it's not that easy. Uh, I tried to implement it and um, the recommendation there, because the idea was to make it as realistic as possible, is to use like traffic traces. Traffic traces has a, have a lot of short flows, and like congestion control doesn't do anything with short flows. It's mostly slow start. So when I was implementing it, I didn't see, I couldn't say anything about it basically. And then I came up with my own test cases for my own stuff. Um, so it's actually not that easy. It's not clear what to do there. And the other thing I want to point out in this. Um, area is that there's also RMCAT, which has some test cases as well, and I think they took a different approach. They took more um, simple artificial test cases, but here the idea was also not to um, say, not to evaluate uh, a congestion control. It was more like, if you test those tests, then you might be safe enough to do further testing on the internet, and you might be safe enough for an experimental RFC. And then if, you, if we see large scale deployment, we can move this to information standard track, whatever, at some point. So um, that was the approach there to allow more experimentation and to make clear that this is an experiment, that you shouldn't like load all your traffic with the stuff. You should really try it out and see what's happening. So are you, are you saying we should, have a, uh, we should have another test suite, but a simpler one that's more like the RMCAT one for TCP variants? Is that what you say? No, I think I, what I'm saying is we should probably use the um, status experimental to do experiments. We, we, sorry, we should use what? The, the RFC status experimental to do experiments. Yeah. Yeah, and make sure that everything that's documented as experimental is an experiment and not a recommendation from the IETF to use it for all your traffic. <laughs> Oh, what have 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 the RFC categories actually mean what they say? <laughs> David Black uh, speaking more, I think, as an individual than a working group chair. I might be following up on Matt's comment, but I'll let Matt be the judge be the judge of that. Uh, he used the word safe, and I think he was using it in the context of congestion control algorithms not doing damage to each other. I seem to be, have been spending a lot of my time in a space where safe means traffic that is not congestion controlled, it's not going to implement cubic or uh, or compound or whatever have you, what are the minimum guardrails that have to be put in that traffic so it doesn't damage the stuff that is congestion controlled? Um, you'll see this turning up in a number of things that have come out of, come out of TSVWG recently, uh, the UDP guidelines and circuit breakers drafts, uh, which, which are now RFCs in particular. And I think that broader question deserves some attention because much as we're going to work on, much as we will work on interesting congestion control algorithms in the transport area, and it's all very good and important, the, some chunk of the IETF is looking for some simple rules to not, to, to, to not screw things up.
Janai Ingar. Uh, I was going to say something else, but I'm going to piggyback on what David just said, which is I think this is this is exactly one reason why Reno is probably going to stick around for for quite a while. It's incredibly easy to implement. It's hard to get wrong, and it works. That's a pretty good reason. I mean, I think I think that having having something that's as simple as Reno to recommend, knowing fully well that anybody who's building a transport protocol is going to experiment with congestion control because there are no interop problems as such, is I think a healthy place. That's where we have been for quite a while. This is the reason that we have BBR. This is the reason we have compound or CTCP, and I think that's not a bad place to be. Have one basic requirement. And then have a bunch of things. Of course, I understand this is a hard problem. How do you specify how they coexist? I I don't have any. I mean, as Lars was pointing out, I remember seeing this quite a while ago too. And it's it's a hard. It's definitely a hard problem. The test suite thing, I don't think scales. We can have a, we can we can come up with a test suite, and I'll tell you now. You start working on it now. You're going to get done with it in about three years from now, and at that point, it's already going to not be useful. It's that's the problem with with the test suite setup. Um, so I don't know how you solve this problem. I don't think the test suite is it. Hi, this is Hannes. Um, I'm trying to read in between the lines what uh, Matt and some other people are saying is, and I try to compare it with the state in a security environment. You have a couple of people who. Uh, from a security context, invent cryptographic algorithms. You get them in, but you obviously don't want all of those because more algorithms mean more problems, let alone the analysis of those. Uh, nobody has time to analyze all sorts of crap that people come up with because the analysis takes much, so much more time than crafting something on your own. So you have that sort of almost like a DDoS attack. Luckily, you don't get too many proposals, so that's, uh, that's a nice thing. So you try to be uh, come up with a way in, in a sense of, you want to say no, but you want to say no in a friendly way by saying, oh, you have to first do these set of tests, which turn out, turns out to be difficult to come up with those, with those tests. In practice, however, the impression I get is um, you have to be a really big player uh, to actually really get something adopted uh, because those players then also go ahead and deploy their stuff right away and then tell you after a few years, we deployed it and it works pretty well. Um, and, and that's how they actually get the work done. This, is, this is not happening in congestion control. N and certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> never, never seen that. So it was a little no. bit of theoretical reading in between the line. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's a, it's a little artificial discussion, it appears to me. So one of the reasons why I speak of a test to check on this is it's actually trivial to write an application that causes congestion collapse. Um, you have a loop with a f that does a fork, and then the child launches a query. And you put a sleep in the outer loop or something like that, and it behaves very nicely under no normal load. But if you ever get into the state where the query takes longer than the sleep, you get cascading, you get compounding load, you get regenerative load. And it's the regenerative, anything that causes regenerative load causes, can, there is some part of the state space where it has congestive collapse. And, and so this is actually very easy to do. DNS does it because it's, it's basically stateless and it's got a two second timer. And if you're in a situation where, for instance, a root server becomes more than two seconds away, everybody's got two queries in the pipe and the presented load doubles. So the consequence of running out of capacity is it latches up and at 50% loss rate, and it does not recover until the load goes down to below half of the bottleneck rate. Um, this is a mess. Um, it's not really fixable in DNS because DNS doesn't have enough stability, but it's really, really easy to write perfectly ordinary sounding applications that take a very conservative TCP implementations and still cause congestive collapse. And these really need to be viewed as transport issues because it's transport dynamics. So do you have a proposal what we should do about it? Well, the, the research question is, is how could you imagine creating a 
test environment or test suite to, to look for regenerative load. Uh, there, there's two different things. One is, is if the presented load rises as the performance goes down, and the other is if the overhead rises as the performance goes, as, your, as the load goes up. And I think of these as being measurement-based things because it's, they often very small details in the state machines cause these problems. Um, I, I don't know if it's actually a bound problem. It might be that once we see the answer, it'll be, oh, we write an RFC about it, and here's a test that everything should be subjected to. And that test would replace the, the TCP-friendly language. Um, it, it may be that there's always going to be new ways in which you can find creative ways of blowing up things, but <laughs> we don't know. Um, hold on, yep. Uh, hi. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, Kevin Hawkins. Sam, so, so one thing that seems to be coming up from uh, this conversation is that there's a, a lot of um, community knowledge about congestion control, um, folk folklore maybe, yeah. it isn't being written down. Um, and I think it would be really useful if, um, as a community, we could try and document some of that, um, so, so that others um, in the community, for example, could build on it. So, uh, rather than having to spend a lot of time um, re refreshing the, the, the wheel um, and documenting the assumptions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, So there have been a number of efforts through the years to write documents about sort of general advice, and they always fail to converge. So, I mean, like, we have the UDP guidance document, which gives some guidance about, like, the minimum you have to do about condition control. Yeah. I have to admit, I don't remember what it says. <laughs> we just updated it. Yeah. And that document might say too much, actually. I mean, it, it, so even so, I mean, like the the point about using congestion control is to avoid congestion columns. Just by having a adaptive congestion control loop, the idea is that if you see increasing load, you would you'd, you'd re reduce your load, right? But if you if you combine this with other mechanisms, or you have implementation errors or whatever, there's still something that can go wrong. Um, last second, so, so um, I'm one of the authors, and I'm, I think I speak for all of the authors when I say, if you make us open that thing up again, we will. <laughs> 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 um, but, but so what it, what it says for UDP actually, I think, captures even Matt's case with overload, right? It basically says that you should um, um, keep an RTT sample if you can, and then if, if you, uh, you know, keep, keep it at most one message outstanding, um, unless you want to do something more complicated like implement an actual congestion control algorithm. But it also has a default timer when you can't, and I think it's like three seconds because that's what TCP uses for the SYN retransmit. Um, right, so it's not only it's not only DNS that has this thing. Um, but they are, they are these sort of, so, and, and the UDP guidelines, I think it says, and I'm in the beginning, that, that many of those uh, thoughts apply to any packet-based thing, right, not really UDP specifically, um, but we didn't want to uh, boil an even larger ocean than, than we're already boiling uh, with this document. David Black is CCWG G Chair. Cut, cut in front of uh, Jana to echo Lars's comment. Um, update, open, et cetera, the UDP guidelines RFC at your own risk. There's lots of sharp pointy spears that will head your direction. Seriously, it is a BCP. It captures the best current practice as we understand the state of the state of knowledge at this time. Lars, Lars, and and Gory and Greg did a really good job on it, and and uh, the, the the product is very good. And I think our wiki page points at it. So our job is done. <laughs> <laughs> So I was going to say that actually piggybacking on this and, and, and trying to go back to a previous thread about uh, Cubic itself. <clears throat> Cubic is, is, well, it's it certainly qualifies as BCP, not necessarily as standard, but I don't want to call it best. So maybe we should come up with a categorization called MCP, most current practice, or something like that. 
deployed current practice. There we go. One of those classifications would be quite useful, I think, for us as as the ID. Because we we've struggled with this for a while. It's like just because it's deployed, we are not going to standardize it. Sure, but let's document it in some form, right? Because that's what cubic the cubic document is. We're not agreeing that it's the best thing on the planet. We are saying it's deployed. It would be quite useful to have that, and I think that actually does go towards you know achieving some of these goals. Maybe so. I'll propose this. Uh, no condition control work gets standardized. They all show up in ICCRG. They are only RG documents because there is no end to any one of those things. It's a fine world to live in. All we need is documentation. They don't need to get standardized at all. Not even cubic. Sorry? Not even cubic. Not even cubic. Why standardize cubic? It's already, I mean, like Google's deployed BBR and others are likely to do other things. Why are we standardizing a condition controller? So I think the difference is the IETF consensus, right? And, uh, and, yeah, this, but IETF, and the message we might give is this one is safe to use. We know this one is safe to use. It's not. Cubic's not safe. Cubic's deployed. <laughs> I mean, the reason we're standardizing it is not because we got together and said that it's a safe thing to use. No, we I mean, got like, together and said it's being used by a ton of companies, therefore it must be safe. Yeah, it's we use it for a while and the internet doesn't didn't melt, so you might still use it. <laughs> That's what I call DCP. That's called a deployed current practice. This is our new, yeah, this is our new definition of TCP friendly. Uh, I just wanted to inject that uh, oh. when Colin was speaking, you know, it came out somewhat garbled in the room. Uh, what he was saying was that there's a lot of import, you know, important folklore knowledge in this conversation that aren't written down, that, that isn't written down. The community should tr uh, try to document that in a form that can be published so it can be referenced. Before I yield the mic to Matt, we also have the DCTCP draft that's hanging around in TCPM. Um, so, so there is a real question of, you know, we sort of, all the same transport folks end up, you know, going to all of these meetings, which happens to be a happy accident. It just doesn't mean that the work is well distributed among these things. Or it's, I, I don't know if it's, if that is as, as Praveen says, is that there's a good process that anybody could follow to figure out exactly where to go for any of this stuff. Um, I really think that we should leave condition control where it is which is evolving all the time, we should embrace that. I don't think there's a reason to say that this is the standard that we recommend. We will never get anybody to use a standard that we recommend. It's always going to be in the past. Yeah, I concur, concur very strongly with that. Um, one of the clues about all of the congestion controls about how well they're doing is you look at the control frequency. Um, I, for many years, gave a slide similar to the one that um, Yu Chung showed earlier, which, you know, the pack, correct packet loss rate to run at some ridiculously high rate. Well, some normal high rate today is 0. 0.00 something or another percent. Um, but the real issue is for, Q, for Reno and under those environments, the correct loss rate is one loss episode every many tens of minutes. And it's like you can't control a system that way. And, and the, and the controls, the, the real fundamental issue is the control frequency has to be in the right range, and it has to not change as you increase the data rate. Um, we, we understand this now, in order for it to scale right, and that means that, that the loss rate, um, any, I don't, want to, I don't want to go into details. The problem with cubic is because of the way the exponential phase goes, as the scale gets larger, the control frequency doesn't keep dropping. Um, I, I don't remember the, the numbers. I haven't worked much with cubic. I, I believe it stays at a few seconds. The amount that it overshoots, when it overshoots, increases. And so it slams everybody else on the network. And that effect gets worse as the network gets faster. And, and as a consequence, people who are competing with cubic at a big scale networks often get drive-by burst losses that are very large that they had nothing to contribute, did not contribute to. But but I agree with the sentiment that we that congestion control is going to keep changing for a long time, and anything that gets the ink dries on is going to be in the rearview mirror. I'm Tim Shepard. I'm not sure I really want to disagree with what Matt or Jana just said, but I one thing is the audience of the. RFCs, people who are like diving into the RFCs because they want to figure out how the internet works because maybe they got handed a piece of the project 
they're working somewhere and they're on some project and they're building something, they're engineers, they're working with engineers and they're the ones who are like, oh, and we're going to need a TCP implementation. And for whatever reasons, they can't just use the Linux kernel or something. And just like, uh, oh boy, we're in a weird situation. We need to write one from scratch and they write a TCP implementation from scratch. They probably should put something in there involving congestion control other than what they can other than what they might imagine from reading TF RFC 793. And uh, I, I can't remember what it says about congestion control. Right. And so, and so I think it's probably useful and not such a bad thing for the IETF to have a default pointer that points to some document that says you should do something. I, I, and I'm not, I'm not even sure I care which thing that pointer is pointing at at the moment, but that's probably a reasonable thing and it's probably not so horribly wrong that some person who's doing a from scratch TCP implementation for some reason implements Reno in it and then they run it through a whole bunch of testing and it all seems to work and they deploy it and they start shipping their products and has anything bad happened because they did that? I don't think so. I think, I mean, unless something shows up. So maybe, you know, for that person, for somebody in that situation, the fact that the IETF is pointing at Reno is probably not such a horrible thing, as long as it's understood that you might have reasons to do something other than Reno. If you're some, you know, if you're one of the world's largest companies and you have lots of data centers, maybe you should have staff that think about what the right thing to do is better than do Reno, and that's fine too. Is that all okay? Maybe we're all, everything's fine. Uh, you're, you're up. Oh, yes. Can you hear me? I just uh, make sure my mic is working. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, actually I want to the presenter to go back one slide. I want to say something about the uh, social aspect of this discussion. If we can, if uh, the slides can move back one page. Uh, can, can you go back to one page? Uh, the one uh, page is number two. Sorry. <laughs> I can't even see what I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> I think it prefer you can simply click click on the page number two. The slides. Two. One. No, that, that's three. Number two. Yeah, this is one. It's four. It's four. It's four. Yeah, yeah, that's it. How many area directors does it take? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I want to bring up one, one, uh, one issue. I think I haven't heard uh, address. I think this is more like uh, going to a social issue now. It's not only technology, because we are talking basically the control of congestion control. And uh, if we look at on this, this particular slide, we see all the competing technology being deployed by different platform. And behind each platform, there is a company. So I think originally, if we back 20 years ago, the congestion control discussion is, around, is, is uh, evolving around the environment which everybody has assumed the open internet, everybody uh, have a nice behavior, so everybody need to be friendly. And I think that probably is the TCP friendless, that's the term actually come from that environment. But now we, our reality now is uh, we are having an internet which is essentially a competitive environment. There are different uh, players, companies, they have competing business interests. Their conscious control objective is essentially try to make their customer happy. And in such an environment, I think talking about friendly probably is not uh, very easy right now. Uh, if, what if we look at a different uh, approach on this uh, whole issue? We know there is going to be a PIX showing up on a path and they're, they're going to take a lot of bandwidth available. And what if we try to identify which congestion control algorithm will be the most robust against uh, around the PIX? And that will deliver the user experience under any environment, under any uh, 
a bunch of pig environment, uh, and a nice environment, or environment that will work best. And that would probably be something IETF can uh, provide guidance to. And then that the, the user to have an idea their application is always going to uh, deliver some kind of a good service. In other words, it is the arm race, just let it race and let us identify what is the best weapon, what is the best the technology come out of from that arm race, which will be most robust and have consistent performance. Thank you. I can just add to this point that like we have how many, I don't know how many years of congestion control research. There are like tons of algorithms out there and we see like very limited deployment of new algorithms. And I think it's because people just don't know which one to use. And we recently see a little bit more deployment because one case is WebRTC because the traditional congestion control really doesn't apply here. Um, and the other one is you have a big company and you have like a lot of resources and you can just do some experiments. But other than that, people just really don't know which one to use. So if they implement anything um, on their own, if they want to use TCP, the only thing they can go to at the moment is new Reno. And then at some point they look at their transmissions and their quality of experience metrics, whatever that is. And they see that it sucks because TCP Reno is not really optimized for today's network. And then they say, oh, that's TCP, it doesn't work, I have to write a new protocol. And at the end, it's just they use a diff the, the wrong congestion control. And as long as we don't give any further guidance than use TCP Reno, this will be going on. So, yeah, I don't know what the guidance is, but I would be super happy if we can give, give any better guidance than that. So I came here to actually sort of agree with Tim, right? So I don't actually think we have a big problem. I, and I don't I think the case that Melia describes is is pretty theoretical, right? I mean, who here writes a new stack and then deploys it on, a, on an amount of systems that may, can move the needle anywhere on the global internet? Almost nobody, right? The, the big stacks are incredibly tightly controlled. There's a lot of engineering going in. And I don't think there's a, it's an arms race either, either right? Because um, we had this going back to BitTorrent and Skype, right? Um, it's, BitTorrent got hammered because uh, they, they basically broke people's Skype calls, right? And if, if Netflix started um, interfering with, I don't know what, Skype or, or some Google service, right? All hell will break loose. So, so they, everybody is in everybody's best interest to avoid that situation, right? So I think we're actually pretty far from an, from an arms race here. Um, I do agree that we want to have... What, what, what Tim said, right? We want to have something that people can can start reading and start learning. And, and you know, New Reno is is you know, yeah, it's not ideal, but it's also not terrible, and it's sort of easily understandable. Um, the the other analogy I was going to make, right? Um, that so, so transport is very similar to security in in terms of IETF. Right? Both of those areas are about telling other people no, uh, no, no, you can't send that packet, right? Or no, no, you can't send that in the clear. So so. Um, and, and in security, right, crypto schemes change, security protocols change. There's, you know, like if you look in TLS, right, there's, there's a bunch of cipher suites that we're deprecating. There's new ones that we're putting in based on what we're understanding the, the attackers can do and what the capabilities are. And that's fine, right? It's, it's a continuously changing thing. And it's, it's similar in transport, right? I think our pace of change is, is slower, but it's the same thing, right? We, we had new Reno, and maybe now we have Cubic, which is better in some cases and, and worse in others. Uh, and we're going to have more um, specialized ones that, that are never going to really run on the internet anyway. Um, and, and that's okay, right? If we have something better, we're going to update the pointer and we're going to say, look at, you know, BBR, for example, like in a couple of years or something. It's okay, right? It, I don't think it, there's a big problem and I don't think there's an arms race necessarily happening. Um, uh, I want to add to that. So, uh, but buffer bloat is a problem. And we know, for example, that Cubic is worsening it. And at this point, it's not an arms race, but if you were kind of trying to compete for the same bottleneck link, you would have to implement Cubic. Right. So there is a problem. So it's not like there is no problem. I, so, so I mean, m many of these have problems, right? Or, or all of the congestion controllers work in, in better in some cases and, and worse in others. And you know, it, it's more about how large the usable envelope is. Um, and, and that's okay, and that can, that can be described, right? And maybe that's something that, that could be an experimental document out of ICCRG, I don't know. 
Um, but but very few of them have sort of catastrophic failures. And and um, buffer bloat is is something that that a congestion controller can't really do anything about anyway, right? It's, it's operating over the path that it's been given. I, I'm not saying we shouldn't fix it, right? We should, we definitely should, and, uh, but it's, I don't th think it's necessarily a congestion control problem. Uh, we have five minutes left, just so this you know. This morning, I, uh, in the ICCRG meeting, I tried to start a discussion about uh, uh, the round trip time and rates uh, dependency on the marking signal. And I think this is a very relevant discussion around this because uh, today it's not so scalable like Reno, the higher the rates, the lower the marking uh, signal. Uh, extremely low, it becomes extremely low. So I think we should open again the discussion about how should a congestion control respond and what is the best to uh, to have a, a scalable signal so that we can uh, go forward with, with drop compatibility and marking, especially marking compatibility. Um, and, and, and today there is uh, um, I, I think there are possibilities also to make it compatible at, at a certain range, also for the normal drop compatibility that we have today. Because okay, when it's it doesn't work very well, we can improve it, like Cubic improved on Reno. Um, I think we can uh, move the the scalability to the positive side and make it compatible for normal situations with Reno and and Cubic. But if the round trip times become bigger and the rates become bigger, we can improve. Uh, and, and correct actually what's what's going wrong. So I believe there there is an opportunity uh, and I welcome everybody to join that discussion. Yeah, there's a lot of mutually conflicting constraints on all of the players, um, but I want to point out one that maybe didn't occur to people. Um, if you're selling advertising, for instance, and somebody clicks on an ad and the entertainment that they happen to be watching interferes with the ad loading, you've done a very bad thing to yourself. And so <laughs> that ad comes from somebody else's server using some unknown technology. Or the, I should say the content, the click through, goes to somebody else's server and somebody else's content. And so there's a very, very severe, extreme penalty for being too aggressive. And although this doesn't apply everywhere, it applies in enough places to cause people to be cautious. Um, and certainly applies to Google, um, <laughs> to say the least. Um, but in fact, we do need to have a story, and especially in the cases where BBR, for example, does very poorly relative to Cubic under some easily demonstrated conditions. It's like, what's the story you tell? And part of the story is we'd like Cubic to just go away. Um, <laughs> um, but we can't cause it to happen. In the transit case, we don't have fairness. Well, guess what? We don't have fairness today. It never existed. It never will exist. Um, it's just, it just has different symptoms in different cases. We want to avoid starvation. We want to avoid other pathologies. But like I said earlier, I don't think it, it's, it, it matters less and less than it ever did before. Yeah, Colin probably has the last word because we're in the last minute. Do you want to press the button, Spencer? Hi, is this working better this time? Yes. Yes, good. Uh, I just wanted to follow up with Lars. Um, I think the issue is less um, an arms race between TCP congestion control um, and more accidental interactions between TCP and multimedia congestion control, for example. And I think that's one area where we don't have any uh, uh, good understanding of um, what, what's happening. Thank you. Yep. Very quick. Um, I've been trying to understand the internet for a long time, longer than I would care to even admit. And part of the challenge of I'm trying to understand the internet is by the time I figured it out, it has changed. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's different. And I think this, you know, the whole notion of TCP friendly is sort of uh, difficult to, to, 
think about these days because of the fact that the net has just been changing. And I'm, so I'm actually used to the fact that the net keeps changing by the time I've under, I think I've understood it. And just uh, like a week and a half ago, I watched a video of Jeff Houston, a talk he gave, I think three or four weeks ago at Apricot 2017. And there's a YouTube video. It's hard to find his, his talk by searching on YouTube unless you know exactly what to search for. And it's Apricot 2017 panel forces shaping the network. Um, and that's on YouTube. It's like a 90 minute video and his talk starts about halfway into that video. And the title of his talk is The Death of Transit and Beyond. And what he, by transit, he means the interconnect. Like when you, if you wanna get connected to the internet, you connect with somebody who can offer you transit. And he actually told a story that convinced me that in some surprisingly short number of years from now, people might not care if their if their internet connection actually has transit or not. And I, I probably should stop there and try instead of trying to explain why that might be true. Anyway, but I found that talk I've watched that talk two times and I've already recommended it to about a dozen people. And I realized that it might be relevant to people who are trying to understand what should we do for congestion control in the future. And that if you watch his talk, it might reset you <laughs> and cause you to stop and wonder what you actually believe anymore about what the internet is. <laughs> so anyway, I thought I'd plug his talk because I found it amazing. I don't know if Jeff's even in the room. He might be in the room. No, maybe not. Anyway, Say. that was it. We have a very, very silent mailing list on ICCRG, and uh, I keep repeating that people, people, you know, you know, because there's so much interest and people want to discuss, but then they don't send emails to the list. So please, <laughs> you know, done. we're done basically. <laughs> Sorry, but we're over time already. So thank you very much for the discussion. Um, I think this was a very good discussion, and I want to go through the minutes and also the Java chat and see if there's anything we could actually write down and con, uh, conserve for the future and give some guidance. But um, other than that, I don't see any action points right now. I think we just operate as we're operating right now. And thank you for your presentations.